Welcome to another installment of the Digital Cinema Show, a series covering the art, science, and business of motion pictures. We're so lucky to have with us today acclaimed cinematographer Stephen Poster, ASC. He's done indie hits like uh, Donnie Darko and Southland Tales to uh, major features like uh, Rocky V, Daddy Daycare, Pee Wee's Big Top, and Stuart Little 2. And one that made a really big impression on me as a young cinematographer uh, was when you did uh, Ridley Scott's Someone to Watch Over Me. It's still one you. of my favorite films. Thank you. Um, he's also credited in his early career uh, being a supporting cinematographer on such classics as Blade Runner, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He also somehow managed during this time to uh, uh, serve as president of the ASC for a couple terms, I think it was. And he's currently the president of the International Cinematographers Guild, uh, IATSE Local 600, of which I'm a proud member. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about your career and how a kid from Chicago manages to make it to Hollywood and become one of the top cinematographers in the business. You know, I just, I was very fortunate in that our family took a driving trip when I was 10 years old across the country from Chicago to Los Angeles to visit relatives. And uh, the first night I was there, it was one of those balmy spring nights where the night blooming jasmine was in bl bloom and the citrus was in bloom. And I walked outside and it smelled like perfume. And I said, oh, I think I'm gonna live here for the rest of my life. <laughs> it took me a while to get back here. I, um, I went to uh, uh, Art Center in my second, uh, third year of, uh, of college, uh, Los Angeles Art Center College of Design, which at that time was in Hollywood and uh, uh, now it's in Pasadena, and uh, went back to Chicago for about 10 years to develop my career and um, managed to uh, um, move out here after that to uh, begin my, t my career in uh, commercials and television, or to continue my career in commercials and begin in television. I, I was very fortunate uh, in that I had a mentor uh, in Chicago who uh, built a house next door to my house in suburban Chicago, and he was a newsreel cameraman named Maury Blackman, who uh, was a union member and worked as a CBS cameraman. And uh, the day, and I was into photography from the time I was ten, uh, and and by the time I was twelve, I knew that photography was going to be my life. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know, you know, was I going to be doing weddings and bar mitzvahs or uh, portraits or news or whatever. Uh, but the day I met him, actually the moment I saw him get out of his old Jaguar uh, with a, a beard and a cap and a, a pipe in his mouth and a light meter on his belt, I ran outside and said, hi, I'm Steven, I, w I live next door. What, what, what kind of light meter is that? And he said, kid, we'll have plenty of time to talk about it. I'm building a house right next door to you. Oh, beautiful. I thought he was the coolest person I'd ever met in my life. And I said, that's what I want to do. And from that point on, I, uh, I managed to, uh, he became my mentor and I managed to uh, uh, begin my career all of, uh, while I was still in college and uh, start shooting commercials and documentaries. And uh, it, was, uh, it was quite uh, um, the build up over the years of, uh, of doing uh, um, all of anything I could get my hands on, medical films, uh, industrial films. We, uh, we used to do a series of 15-minute uh, films, 16-millimeter films for industrials. That was sort of a pattern back then, and I even produced a bunch of them. And uh, it was anything from factories making mufflers to pharmaceuticals. Uh, and then finally, I realized that uh, uh, the first lesson I had in how to turn down a job came after a... Uh, a guy in Chicago who did a lot of medical films came to me and said, we're gonna do a film about bed sores and we're gonna get underneath and a guy's gonna be on plastic and we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, photograph the bed sores from underneath. And I said, finally, I said, I think I'm gonna pass on this. <laughs> I'm already busy, I'm sorry, see you later. And, uh, but, but it was that kind of work. It was whatever you could do to put film through a camera at that time. Um, and uh, uh, I, I remember the first time I ever saw 35 millimeter and and and, and on a commercial, um, 
I walked into a, a, a company that was a, a boutique commercial company that actually was based on cinema verite, and all of them uh, uh, were documentarians who were trying to get into commercials. None of them knew anything about lighting. So they looked at a little film that I, I did. Uh, I was still a senior in college. They looked at a little film that I did in college and they said, well, you know how to light. And I said, well, yeah, I've been a photographer, art center, this, that. And they said, so we're gonna hire you as a cameraman because I was it going in for a job as an assistant. And I said, okay, I'm a cameraman. And that was it. And I was a grown up DP and then a week later they said, uh, Quaker Oats is coming in for a TV commercial. Uh, it's 35 millimeter. We've got a, uh, a Mark II Mitchell and a blimp, uh, which there was only two built, two blimps for the Mark II, right? Uh, and uh, you got all weekend to figure it out, and uh, and 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 you shoot on Monday morning. Yeah, at least they gave you the weekend. <laughs> yeah, right. And from Friday night to and, and I, I had to figure it came in 35 cases. So some of the cases were like this big with with gears and and pieces that you, who knew where they where they fit. But uh, it was uh, it, it was that kind of weekend that I spent all day Saturday opening each box, trying to figure out where it fit, how it fit together. I finally, by Saturday night, I got the, uh, the, the camera put together in the blimp, and I realized it was on the floor of the studio and it was too heavy for me to pick up and put on the dolly. So I, I ran outside and, and, and found a stranger to come in to help me put it up on the, uh, on the, on the dolly. Uh, and uh, then there was a, a gearhead, and I'd never seen a gearhead. And so all day Sunday, I practiced with the gearhead, and I did pretty well with it on Monday, and, and did the lighting and did, and did the shooting. Uh, there was only one moment when uh, a, a zoom in sort of corkscrewed in, but to this day, I think it was the, it was the zoom that wasn't tracking. <laughs> The rest is history. Yeah. But uh, must have uh, been a great turning point when you got in Close Encounters. How did that break come? You know, I'd, I'd moved out to uh, California and I was struggling because I wasn't in the, uh, in the local out here. Um, actually, I got in the local, but I wasn't, th there was a tier system. And you couldn't work if you were group three. I could work commercials and things. And uh, uh, I managed to do a commercial um, back in Chicago as, a, as one of the operators for Vilmos. And uh, uh, I, 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 I had gotten an agent by that point, which was Creighton Smith, and Creighton was probably the first uh, below the line agent that ever existed. And um, uh, Creighton put me together with Vilmos to, uh, to go to Mobile to do Close Encounters. And that was a big break for me. It was a huge break. Uh, can you tell us about what it was like working with the late great Vilmos Sigmund? He was, first of all, always a true gentleman. I mean, he was a sweet and wonderful guy who was passionate about what he did. But Vilmos had a, 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 an ability to kind of, in the face of anything, put his head down and go forward, no matter what happened. And believe me, there was five times that, that he was threatened to be fired on that movie and five times that he might have been threatened but in our community at that point nobody would take over for him. So he had to, have to come back the next day and uh, he, he never let that affect him, he just went forward and it was a great lesson to, to really understand perseverance and, and what it takes in this business to succeed. Um, but uh, every time they were in trouble for money or whatever, they would blame it on him. And he would get fired and he'd come back the next day. Uh, it, 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 was, it was truly delightful. The first, the first few weeks I was there, because it was 14 weeks, the first few weeks I was there, uh, Spielberg would not let me touch a camera. I was the Chicago guy, go sit in a corner. And uh, uh, finally we were doing the party scene in the backyard, the suburban party scene in the backyard. And uh, uh, Stephen came up to me and said, uh, all right, go take a camera and an assistant, go show me what you can do, get me some stuff from this party. And uh, a, a, a few days later, the, um, on, on a Friday, I'll never forget this, on a Friday, the uh, dailies came in and uh, the dailies played and then they played my second unit or my additional 
shooting dailies and nobody said a word. And I left and Vilmos, you know, sort of nodded to me. It was okay, fine. And on Sunday, I got a call. My wife was there with me. Um, and uh, I got a call from uh, Rick Fields, who was Stephen's assistant on that movie. Rick was also Verna Fields' son, the, uh, the ed famous mm -hmm. editor, Verna Fields. Uh, and Rick said, uh, Stephen wants to talk to you. Uh, uh, come over to the editing room. Uh-oh. So I kind of prepared myself. I said to my wife, I think we're going to be fired. I'm going home. I'm sorry, but this is what's going on. And I went over to the editing room, and uh, uh, Stephen uh, looked up at me from the, he was, they were on the chem, and Stephen looked up at me and, and said, uh, all right, I want you to go out and do these five-second unit shots this week. Here's what they are. Bum, 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 bum. And I said, oh, okay. So I'm not fired. I wasn't fired. <laughs> I went home, and like a good... Uh, Chicago filmmaker I figured everything out on paper I went in as though I was the producer right and uh, and he said to me he said go talk to Ju Julia Phillips in, in, in the morning and tell her we're gonna do this I very you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed <laughs> went into Julia's office the next morning and I said Julia Stephen wants to do these five uh, uh, second unit shots who the hell are you to tell me we are going to do? We have no money for a second unit. 45 minutes later, and she tore me a new one, and, <laughs> and it was like I was the messenger, and she was killing the messenger, definitely. <laughs> and finally she said, oh, all right, go tell Clark Palo, the production manager. <laughs> and I went into Clark's room, and I said, Clark, Stephen wants me to do it. And Clark started off on me, and finally, after about a half hour of yelling at me, he said, okay, okay, uh, you, you know, take the guys you need and go out and do it. And I went out and did it, and from that point on, every day. So you did pay your dues. Oh, I paid big dues, but, but it, 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 was, it wasn't carrying cases. It was listening to being <laughs> abused, you know. After four months of rigging the big stage with 90 feet up, the permanents were 90 feet up. They, were, they had like 30 arcs and... And, and 40 10Ks up there, and, and it, it was about 130 degrees up there, but it was uh, about, they're building all this stuff. They built the rolling platform with the arcs and, and 10Ks for uh, the, the traveling light of the, of the spaceship, and, and it was huge. It was, it, at that time, it was the largest set ever built indoors for a motion picture. And uh, so they were scheduled to go start shooting in this, on the stage on Monday, and Vilmer said, I can't do that. I haven't even turned a light on. We've just been rigging. That's not lighting. I need to be able to turn the lights on and, and focus them. And they said, well, no, we can't stop the production to do that. And he said, I must, I insist. And they said, so they thought he would absolutely say no. They said, well, if you give the first unit to Stephen Poster, then you can take your gaffer and, and go in and do that. And he said, okay. There it was, my first grown-up day <laughs> on a feature film, which was the evacuation scene, 1,500 wow. extras, uh, trains, uh, a, a Titan crane, uh, 15 arcs outside. I had never lit with an arc at that point. Um, I'd never been on a Titan crane at that point. And uh, that was my first day as a grown-up DP on a feature film. Trial by fire. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I bet you have some Ridley Scott stories too. Well, Ridley, uh, Ridley was a, a, a very fascinating guy, is a very fascinating guy to, to, to watch and to work with and to collaborate with. Um, I came in, I, I, was, I was called in for one shot uh, that had been tried three or four times, I had no idea, but uh, uh, before I came in, and he never liked what he saw. Uh, so by this time, the studio was completely disgusted, and they said, all right, you can go out there and uh, do this shot, but you don't have any lights, we're not sending any lights with you, and uh, all you got is a water truck and a camera truck and some guys to work with. And the shot was, Harrison Ford's car, which was called the Spinner, driving through the Second Street Tunnel, the White Tunnel. I had no prior knowledge of what had been done before, or, or the fact that I was, you know, like it was like a test or something. I was just—they were just humoring uh, Ridley, 
And I went out there and I, I looked at it and there was um, that white shiny tile and it was, it was a very, very hot day, hot night. And, and the, the water, we'd send the water truck through and it would evaporate about five <laughs> minutes after that. But uh, I, I had all of the guys' uh, cars that came with us and all the, the few trucks that we had go to the other side of the tunnel and and uh, shine their lights and their brights, their headlights, their headlights <laughs> at us. And uh, uh, we even laid in a little bit of smoke uh, and, and wet down and shot it a few times. I took the camera, put it on a sandbag and, um, and uh, shot it and came back, uh, um, went, to, went to bed, woke up the next day and got a call that said, uh, Ridley wants you to come in. Oh, you're fired again. <laughs> uh, there, yeah, there I was. Well, I was a little more secure at that point, but uh, uh, he, he liked what I had done because nobody had ever, everybody was shooting from up here. I was the first guy that put the camera down low and gave it some perspective and had these swirling kind of lights on the, on the white tile. And he liked that and he kept me there for the rest of the film, which is about another three weeks. And we were doing, they were, they were into their very uh, complicated visual effects. They would do two or three shots a day. Hmm. And uh, um, I mean, Jordan Cronenworth was wonderful, a wonderful human being, one of the, he was the best of us. He was wonderful, gentle, sweet, and what a talent, what an eye. Uh, and uh, he kind of gave me free reign to, uh, to go out and uh, uh, do whatever Ridley wanted to do. And we would go uh, to other stages where there were sets built and, and do entire scenes. Like the, the scene in the uh, uh, snake lady Joanna Cassidy's dressing room where he gets uh, beat up. We, did the sh we shot that entire scene wow. because you know, it was just handheld camera and going in there and, and uh, lighting and uh, I had my crew and, and uh, we, we did that and a number of other little pieces like that that were very important. So it was, uh, it was, a, real, it was a really great experience for me again uh, for about three weeks to, to get to know Ridley. Well, let me get your take on technology. I know as a leader of the union and in your position as a cinematographer, you need to stay up on top of everything. Uh, what do you think is the promise and what are some of the challenges with uh, some of the new technology like um, cameras, uh, HDR, high frame rate? I mean, there's so many things coming out uh, uh, all the time. What do you, uh, you know, what do you like and, and what do you I, I, I think I have a, a, a broader perspective to all of it because I started um, almost by chance, but I started experimenting with HD uh, in the very early days, in the early, early 90s. It was, it was a Sony back end and a Panavision front end uh, and uh, um, some image processing from NHK and I was hired to do this experimental piece to show how this camera could be used to shoot a motion picture. Uh, we went out for a week and shot a, a little short. Um, the, the camera was attached to a bread truck with a cable about that thick. Uh, I did everything I could to break it, uh, but it, it performed. It was, and I was very pleased with it. I saw it on the big screen, I was very pleased. And it was supposed to go to uh, the Montreux High Definition Film Festival. And just before we were supposed to go to Switzerland to do that, uh, I got a call that said they, Sony pulled it. And I said, why? Nobody would tell me and nobody would say a word. And finally, a, about a year later, I found out that they thought it was too pretty. It looked too much like a, a commercial. And I said, well, what was it that you wanted? And they said, oh, sharp, sharp, sharp. And you know, I'm here I am using heavy diffusion and doing all the things I would do if I were making a motion picture. Mm -hmm. So they buried it and we never saw it. Wow. it so this was my introduction to the world of, of high def. And uh, not being shy, I, uh, I started uh, doing some speaking about the process and what I thought it needed. I went to Japan and uh, uh, spoke in front of the High Vision Society, 
which was all of the engineers and, and people working in, in Japan to develop high definition. Uh, and I got involved politically with it. Uh, that we, and and uh, maybe one of the people that kind of was responsible for us ending up at this point with 4K and beyond. Um, I'm not a big fan of 4K, but I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how, how I work with it. Um, we all kept saying, uh, well, if, if you're going to try and replace film, it's not going to work unless you go to 4K. And this was early on, and everybody was saying, oh, no, no, high def is enough. It's more than enough. You never have to go any higher than that. And I, we kept, the, all the guys at the ASC kept saying, no, if you're going to emulate film, it has to be at least 4K, because that's what we calculated it out to be. Nobody had taken into consideration what that actually looked like on, on digital. Um, but but that's, we were trying to hold out for that and, and hopefully stave off the death of film at that point. Um, when we finally got to 4K, actually, I kept saying that uh, uh, this isn't ready for prime time, we're not ready for this. There was the 900 and they were doing television shows with it and I had done a couple of shows with it. And I kept saying, it's not, it's not good enough, it's not good enough, it's not good enough. I kept pushing and, and everybody thought, the, the, everybody being the manufacturers and, and vendors thought I was anti-digital. I really wasn't. I was just trying to push them to make it better. And uh, eventually, the Genesis came out, and I thought that was the first real camera that existed. And uh, uh, I actually announced it at NAB, uh, not at NAB, at IBC in Amsterdam, saying that I think we finally re reached a point where we now have a camera that can, can really emulate a motion picture camera. And that was the beginning, sort of the beginning of the end of film. <laughs> Well, that's, a, that's a complicated subject. Yeah. Oh, it really is. It really is. So you're not a tremendous fan of um, higher um, resolution, but um, how can you argue with the high dynamic range? That's, uh, that's a pretty nice attribute. I've always been trying to find uh, ways of, of maintaining the ability to suspend disbelief. Mm -hmm. I started looking at uh, that process because you, if in the days when we had 30 frame video, I saw the first couple things I shot in 30 frames and it looked like live video. And there was the magic. <laughs> there was something about it that was uncomfortable, that had a temporal feeling that, that it, was, it was almost like a telenovela. It was live video. And I started doing research uh, at that time, and I also saw Showtime, ShowScan, uh, Doug Trumbull's process of 60, shooting at 60 uh, and projecting at 60. And again, I felt like there was no way to really suspend disbelief and just get into the story. Um, so I, I, uh, I started campaigning against that and uh, uh, campaigning for a 24 frame progressive camera. It was a campaign to not lose the effect of 24 frames a second, which has some kind of magical sweet spot, even though it's 48 images a second on screen because of the double-bladed shutter. The, the process of suspending disbelief is fascinating because you can go into a live theater and have lights all around and a proscenium and people all, all around you in the audience. And if it's a good play, you're gonna get into the story and you're just gonna, gonna you know, forget about everything else. That's, that's what we're talking about in terms of movies. You wanna go see a movie to, uh, or, or, or watch a television show and be able to get into the story. But if it looks like live video, uh, and, and, and if it looks like there's too much information there, your brain won't allow that kind of translation. So I'm always looking for ways to, uh, to enhance the, the audience's ability to suspend disbelief. Um, high dynamic range, the perfect thing about high dynamic range is to be able to say, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Again, we cinematographers need the control. It's great to have the overhead. It's great to have a, 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 a highlight that's so hot that you wouldn't normally be able to record anything in it be viable. 
and a shadow. But but we spend a lot of times, uh, a lot of time as as artists throwing things out, taking things off the canvas so, so that you can see what you it. Don't see what you don't see, uh, leading the eye in ways that you do. But we're 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 finding out that with high dynamic range, you need higher uh, luminance. You, you're, you're getting into a thousand nit cam, uh, a project, or, um, uh, TVs. And with that kind of brightness, you start to see the flicker more. So there's something that needs to be done to, uh, uh, to mitigate that. And what they're doing now is doing higher speed frame rates and Back to that again. <laughs> back to back to that same problem again. And we're and we're working on it. I'm I'm working with uh, Reed Morano, uh, ASC, who's a wonderful cinematographer, and she's been on a campaign to eliminate, uh, or or at least have it be in control of the consumer, um, uh, smooth motion or motion interpolation. Yeah which does the same thing. It does not allow you to suspend disbelief. There's no time, I mean, it, it, it doesn't, there, there's none of the qualities of, of a motion picture that, that come out of that. So um, there's, there's all that uh, kind of, and the K wars that, that went on, you know, with, with uh, more and more and more resolution. I think that what's important now, and I did my, my, the next film that's coming out, Amityville, Amityville Awakening, uh, um, at 2K 12 bit, because I wanted the color depth. Mm -hmm. I think the next K War is going to be more about color depth. Because how far can they how go? How many bits? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's very important to to have that color depth to be able to render uh, the image uh, in a, in a way that has an artistic quality to it. Yeah. Well, the argument uh, for some of these things, like uh, higher resolution, is that you future-proof it. And I just saw a comment the other day on, I think it was CML. Somebody said, if you want something to be future-proofed, make something that people will want to see in the future. Like, yeah, know, good it's point. Like, make good content. That's what it's I about. I was on a panel at Hollywood Post Alliance, or at now Hollywood Production Alliance, uh, and Bill Bennett said, uh, somebody asked him about HDR, and he said, well, the original HDR was film. Yeah. You know, 16 stops of range, that's HDR. How do you help um, union members prepare for all this new technology? Training, 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 information and training. There's, there's two components to that. First of all, we have spent a lot of energy mining the field for new technology. What is ours? What is making images and why is it, is it not ours? We should take it. We've done that for the last two and a half years with drones. We're now very involved with uh, looking at technologies like um, virtual reality, augmented reality, to see where our role is. We now own drones. Uh, we have more of the drone operators, the licensed drone operators, uh, as members of the guild um, th than are, are not, and, and these people are, are are starting to be paid as uh, as union members, which is which is what we're looking for. And uh, virtual reality is very early on, and we're we're still, but we're still looking at what what it's going to take. So every new technology that comes along, or that uh, light lightro, uh, light field mm -hmm. photography, we're looking into that. Um, we're mining the field for jobs for what our jobs are going to be in the future. Uh, and then we're doing everything we can to train. We have a, 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 a good sized training budget that, in fact, I want to spend every year. I've, I've benefited by it greatly myself. Great. Yeah, so I, I know it uh, can speak firsthand. It's, uh, it's terrific, all the, the programs that you've uh, initiated. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what advice can you give to a young filmmaker that uh, might want to follow in your footsteps? Shoot, 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 shoot. Make images. Never stop. Uh, I, I don't care if you're if, if it's if it's a job to shoot dog shit on the street. Shoot it. Get as much experience as you can. Persevere. Perseverance is the key to getting a job, to to getting a career, developing a career. If you can persevere over a number of years, uh, you, you're going to you're going to get in and you're gonna get an opportunity. 
and if and, and you have to be ready to make that opportunity work for you but uh, but but just take everything you can initially just to get the experience into work well, we thank you so much for My your pleasure. service to the community thank coming you. in here to speak to us today. Absolutely. What a wonderful interview. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. This episode is made possible by the support of Video Devices, a brand of video products developed by Sound Devices, LLC. It includes the new PIX-E series of 4K recording monitors. We welcome your input, so please follow us on Vimeo, YouTube, or our Facebook page. If you would like to support our efforts, please also consider joining the Digital Cinema Society. Membership's available to anyone, whether you can afford it or not. It's always free to students. Uh, we suggest a $30 annual contribution from those who can afford it, or a lifetime membership at $100.